Good evening, everybody, and thank you for having me here. Let's see if this technology situation works. I, you know, for being a technologist, I always break everything, so I apologize in advance. So uh, I want to start by um, explaining what this means, because for non-English speakers, this may be confusing. This is uh, uh, Isaac Newton saying, um, that he could see further only because he was stood on the shoulders of giants. What this means uh, for a non-English speaker is that he was able to achieve what he achieved um, and discover what he discovered only because he remixed stuff and borrowed from others. So I wanna talk a little bit and um, about that and I wanna go uh, follow in his stead and stand on the shoulders of giants that are here in this room today. Every single image in this presentation is, uh, it has been made by somebody who donated it um, with the Creative Commons license. And I will take you on a journey that connects both the early morning presentation on economics and uh, the emotion uh, emotional connection at the very end. So uh, let's start with economics. And to me, economics means getting some pizza. So um, one concept that this illustrates is a, uh, is a concept of rivalry. What li rivalry means is that if I have something and I consume it like a piece of pizza, you can no longer have it. And uh, you have to get a new one. It's, it, it means that there's a world, it's, it's very common for the world of scarcity, where resources are very limited. So uh, if you can't have pizza, can you have more knowledge? And in fact, up until fairly recently, knowledge did and still does, and to a great extent, abide by the same standard, because it actually takes resources to print a book. Uh, and uh, when you sit in a classroom, there's one teacher, let's say 20 students, 20 books. Maybe in the olden days, there's an encyclopedia uh, on the wall. So there's only so many students you can educate at any given time. And the same thing with print. We got from uh, me telling you an idea, you telling somebody else, uh, to being able to replicate it on paper, ultimately on print. But then computers came along and everything, this, this world of scarcity of ideas, this world of rivalry, completely got flipped on its head. Magic happened. So, and with that magic, um, a lot of interesting things came along, including all of you here. So this is an image of um, the NASA's image that NASA released when they discovered that those uh, black streaks in the eyes is actually water. Um, so they announced the water on Mars, and that news went simultaneously to eight billion people. Um, and everybody could consume that news and that information at the same exact time. Well, no, I, I actually didn't get it. Didn't get the memo in time. My 10-year-old son got it before me, which was kind of embarrassing. Um, so, all of a sudden, something that was very, um, very protected and very scarce, scarce became infinitely shareable with infinite amount of people for infinite amount of time. But it's not just about consumption. We're still living in the world where even though so much information is now produced, it's shared, the rules are still the rules of the old world. And they're trying to keep all of this information from getting out there, from being free. They're trying to lock this door. And it's it hinders both economic growth, but also our growth as human beings when that happens. Um, and, and it's really critical for us to start thinking, what do we need to do when the cost of replication goes to zero and when we have the opportunities that present ourselves with, uh, with the, free, the free knowledge and the free world? So 
this new abundance of information and knowledge is expanding very, very rapidly. And um, I spent the earlier part of this week in Japan, and one of the people that I met there was a student in astrophysics. And as one would do with a student in astrophysics, you spend the time talking to them about different questions. So the questions that uh, he is asking is how to accelerate to the speed of light or asymptotically close to it. Um, and we started talking about how he got to this place of studying astrophysics. And he talked to me about how he asked questions. Remember when children, you know, they're really young, they keep asking this, this why questions, they just keep trying to claw the information out of you get as much knowledge out of their parents, their parents are those giants. So they keep asking and asking. And my friend, he, about at about age 13, he really um, got to the limit of what his parents could teach him. And I just thought to myself, oh my god, uh, I got to that limit with my son when he was nine. I could no longer answer him. He started asking me something about atoms and how to split them. And, and what is going to happen with this generation? We can't send them to college when they're, when they're nine. So what are we going to do? This, the, as parents, we're failing faster. We're, we're running out of information. So they need to be standing in the next generation and the next generation. And the education that has to come along with that needs to put our children on, uh, on the shoulders of bigger giants, on the shoulders of the entire community, uh, human community, world's community, the community of knowledge. So my, as, as I was saying, this 10-year-old can get information before, uh, before somebody who, who gets it almost directly from the source. So how? How does that happen? And th that's a really important question because it's not just about the information that's out there. It's about the synthesis. Somebody took that information, correlated, put it into a place where it reached, uh, it, it reached its audience. And those people are people we know very well today. Some of you are here uh, today. Those are Wikipedians um, and Wikimedians. P that's a really great example of how this incredible body of information actually gets correlated. And all ideas, at the end of the day, are derivative works. And somebody says, uh, has an original idea, it makes me laugh. Because everything is learned and everything is correlated and transformed into something else. So the faster we share those ideas, the faster we learn. So in order to do that, we need this access to knowledge of yesterday, of today, and of, of now as quickly as we can. So all of us, in other words, all of us need those giants. And what's incredible is those giants, we are those giants in this room. Because every single person in this room has created something and made something for others to use, to learn, and to grow with. Wikipedia and Creative Commons are a symbiotic relationship in that way. Wikipedia would not be possible without what Creative Commons en uh, enables and the things that people produce with it. We both have really big missions. For Wikipedians, it is a world in, every, in which every human being is like you here today that every single human being shares in the sum of all knowledge. And that is a very ambitious proposition. And the question is, how do we, us, all of us in this room, not just replicate knowledge, not just create knowledge, but replicate our thinking, our mental model, our belief system? How do we convince the rest of the world that this is a better place? How do we make it? the vision for everyone in the world to create a world like this. And I think it is really critical for us to be there to strengthen one another. We need one another, and we need another hundreds, if not thousands of communities in this boat with us in order for this to become the main, the dominant way of thinking about the world. And Wikipedia, is pretty successful with that, with the help of Creative Commons. As you can see, about half a billion people 
go to Wikipedia every month to find knowledge. There, and the knowledge is available, there's 291 languages uh, in which Wikipedia is available. There are nearly a uh, hundred uh, different organizations around the world that uh, there are Wikimedia organizations. And in terms of knowledge creations, there are about 8,000 articles that get created every single day. That's pretty amazing, you would say, right? I think we're not keeping up. I think there is so much knowledge that's getting produced there. And so many people that are coming online in need of it that we need to figure out how can we do this faster, how we can do this better, and how can we most importantly engage more communities and bring them with us. And our communities of knowledge are amazing. Here's an image that you see that a contributor Sabhar Nab and uh, uh, put online under Creative Commons license. Well, without his even knowledge, this image has been reused on this article about the definition of child on at least three Wikipedias. And it's used much more than just this. So, so he was the original giant that, and then hundreds of people came in to write, write the articles that were the giants that came, uh, stepped on his shoulders. And now we can use this for whatever other works we want to produce. Wikipedians do many things. Another thing that is really important that, that we do together is preserving the heritage of this planet, preserving the, her the history of this world, because the history is constantly changing. And we keep it up to date. We keep it constantly going. So um, last April, when disaster strike, when the earthquake stro uh, stroke in Nepal, our community around the world started to work on pulling together the images of the, this, this, of the um, architecture that was broken, of, uh, of the artifacts that were de destroyed. Within a couple of months, they pulled together 1,500 images of the artifacts that disappeared. In fact, one of our first Wikipedians in Nepal, Ram Prasad, who lives three hours away from the nearest road in a place where there is no electricity, he does all of his edits with a little phone. It's not, it's not even a feature phone. Um, and he charges it off, of, it off of the solar power. He made 6,000 edits all by himself on this little tiny phone. So it's really, really remarkable. And of course, uh, probably everybody here knows about uh, Basil, who single-handedly tried to pull together uh, as much information and as much imagery as possible around the amazing city of uh, Palmyria in, uh, in Syria when it got targeted by ISIS for destruction. The city is one of the, um, one of the amazing places in the world. Uh, its history goes back to around um, Neolithic period, 9,500 years ago. We really hope that we'll hear from him soon. All, all of these, all of these are example of Wikipedians and Creative Commons working together side by side, supporting the society, supporting the generations that are coming behind us. In art, Michael Manderberg, created a recent project where he printed uh, Wikipedia, just English Wikipedia, and put, tried to put it on the wall. Well, the wall didn't, it didn't fit. There were 7,437 tomes of it. You can purchase one now that the project is over. That, and have a tome of Wikipedia accurate as of April 7th, 2015. And of course, a lot of us here probably also heard of Jack Andraka, who um, was oh, 
barely a teenager, he was 13 or 14, when uh, uh, one of his uh, family members uh, got diagnosed with cancer. And he started his research on Wikipedia and ended up developing a much better, much less expensive test for prostatic cancer. That test is now going through the FDC approval. This is the kind of stuff, this are the, these are the kinds of giants that you all support. But being a giant is not enough. Creating another, supporting another person is also not enough. We need to grow and nurture that, those other giants. We need to turn the world into, into a world of people who share and help others. And the, the fact is that the world is growing in such a rap at a, such a rapid pace that the fact that there is going to be an enormous amount of free knowledge is can be we can take that for granted we we know it's going to happen there is it's it's a tide that's coming we just need to figure out how do we ride the tide and how do we help to teach the world and to give them give everyone this ability to learn. This quote, by the way, is out of date. The quote is, uh, I think, about seven years old. The rate of knowledge creation has sped up so much, he's talking about every decade here, the uh, current rate is every 12 months, and it's accelerating. So we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity with, uh, with how we're working together, but we, there is much, much more that we can do. The current version of the license really helps us. It really helps us move into this new direction and frees us up from the mechanics of, um, of this work into advocacy, into the programmatic work that needs to be done now that we have the baseline. So um, I would argue that our most important first step is really now to get awareness. A lot of people still do not know how to release their information, how to do this, why they would be doing this. We need to help people understand the why, the mindset, and how to do it, and, and how to do it in different languages and in different countries. And with a global movement like ours, we can absolutely do this. The next one, and a few people today talked about it, are the standards. It's not enough just to have the license. It's really important to have the right metadata. It's really important to have the right structure if we're talking about open knowledge uh, and if we're talking about open data. So we need to come together and get behind uh, uh, a way that everybody can, um, that everybody in the world can use because otherwise what will happen is interoperability. Everybody will have their own standard and, uh, uh, and the basically the, this little pockets of free information will not work together. And again, uh, our organizations are working, uh, working together at least on one aspect of this. Internalization and interoperability. Um, earlier this week, as I was saying, I was in Japan and I was talking to uh, one of the um, legal uh, administrators there in the government and he was telling me how important it was to get uh, the fourth version of the license in English. And Wikipedians, Wikimedians have been helping translate the licenses. In fact, we've lost some ground with version three because we did not have the translation. And what happens when uh, when we lose ground is people are starting to create their own licenses. They're starting to, uh, to, uh, to fork off and uh, as a result we, uh, we start losing visibility into, into what's going on. But there's more, much more we can do. People do this for a reason. They're passionate about something. So this is a glam wiki, wiki picture. People, um, glam people work with um, libraries, galleries, archives and museums around the world to free the content and to put that online under free license. We can do this together. Our communities are global. Uh, anybody who's interested in it can come together to work behind this. And this is just one of those programs. We have education program we have, uh, that, that is active in, in more than 70 countries around the world. We have a library program which, uh, which brings in uh, STEM um, 
STEM content around uh, into, into Wikipedia and can access to free content. But most importantly, and something is ringing here, uh, most importantly, we need to connect technology and humanity. Uh, we need to connect, connect our ability to uh, create these works, uh, to make them available with people's desires and people's thinking around it. We, we need to not just share, we need to bring synthesis and exploration and share at the end of the day, like I was saying, share who we are and how we think about the world so we can shift the paradigm of this of this little planet so that we can ultimately create not just a replica of Wikipedia but the book of knowledge that Yahai talks about we are at the second step of the law of diffusion of innovation we've innovated we've got this off the ground we now need to make it known we need everybody to know about this so that we can get all of those people that uh, in the morning we were talking about that are kind of blah on the sidelines, I'll do it if everybody else does it, in order to get them to participate, we need to make our voices heard. We are those innovators. We showed what this can do, and we are the very, very critical point. Now we have an opportunity and responsibility to bring the world with us. Because we don't know where that next giant might be. She might be finding the way to Andromeda. And we need to get ready to get her there. And the only way we can do this is by doing this together. Thank you. Thank you.